Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 59. We'll talk about uh, some of the COVID vaccine issues and logistics and a little bit about rural urban health disparities. Uh, so again, keeping with the theme, let's try to keep Nebraska deaths below 2,000 and we have to do two things to do that. Number one is just basic control measures. Wear the mask around anyone who doesn't live in your house. Avoid crowded confined spaces and keep your distance, ideally at least six feet. Uh, that's the most important thing to do right now because you don't know when your vaccine number is going to get called, but when it is called, let's get everybody vaccinated. If we do these two things, we could be back to pretty much a normal life uh, by the summer, but we got to do both of them, not just one. Uh, how are we doing on the control? We're, you know, kind of mixed message. You know, we, we did keep, uh, we overwhelmed our hospitals in November. We got it down a little bit, had a rebound after Thanksgiving, had a big drop uh, up until the holidays, but now we're rebounding a little bit again, unfortunately. Uh, to get under control, we need to be down in this 10 to 20 per a hundred thousand or less not way up here so we're still in an out of control we're not at, at as much danger of uh, overwing our hospital the problem though is this can rebound really fast unfortunately as they're finding out all across the country so we're, we're not out of the woods yet we need to get this back down more uh, we've made some progress hopefully this is a temporary rebound and hopefully we'll start seeing some change there uh, vaccine rollout. The good news is, of course, uh, we're already moving uh, on to other uh, populations in Nebraska. Uh, the CDC is trying to do its best, best with transparency, although the site's kind of clunky. Uh, you can't really see very well who's doing best on this. Uh, so they're kind of trying, but uh, it could do better. Uh, so as usual, we're not going to the CDC. We're going to other sites. Uh, so Washington Post, I think, has a pretty decent site where they can actually, you can simply track and refresh their efforts every day. I put this link out there. The good news is, although the, the, the U.S. rollout is not as smooth as other countries, countries uh, like Israel, for example. Uh, Nebraska, though, is above average. We're number seven as of this morning, so uh, we're a little more efficient in Nebraska. Uh, sounds like it's going very smooth, especially in some of our rural areas that have already, already moved through their, their first priority population. They're moving on, uh, and so uh, hopefully uh, we'll keep doing this better. Uh, the state is working at some transparency, but they're not going to put any regional stuff up until February, unfortunately, so I'm not sure what's taking them so long to get that up and running. Uh, the data is there. Uh, you know, a physician I know uh, uh, was able to look this up, and you know, their two vaccines are in there, so it's in Nessa. So they have the the data to to get this up in life sooner. Uh, that's why we at HealthyNebraska.org we've been putting trying to put these on our on our our ta public tableau. So if you go there, you know we have uh, uh, so regional versions of how much coronavirus is spread. We'll see if we can find uh, the same data at some point uh, if the state's going to take till February. Uh, what you're seeing, which is kind of frustrating for you from a public health perspective, is the governmental sites are slow to get things up and running, uh, and so you're seeing nonprofits and the news media putting stuff up there ahead of time. Uh, as we wait. Uh, now, I don't think you can blame public health because they've been underinvested for decades, unfortunately. And so why is it taking public health so long to respond? Why is our rollout so inefficient? It's because they're understaffed, uh, underskilled, under-resourced. Uh, hopefully we'll fix that in the future and not let us get to that point again. Uh, I think this uh, far side uh, cartoon is a pretty good example of what's gone wrong. Uh, I don't get it after all the budget cuts to streamline the workforce. Why aren't we moving faster? We've just cut public health too much, so it's hard for them to turn stuff like this around, unfortunately. Um, so we are going to put stuff out, and I want to talk about uh, health disparities because in Nebraska, uh, we've been uh, declining on our health uh, uh, compared to our peers. Uh, and our and our biggest, big, one of our biggest problems in Nebraska is our urban rural health disparities. They're actually as big or worse than our uh, uh, my, our disparities just on income or race, for example. Uh, and so influenza vaccination, you know, this is uh, very timely that we've got this big degree of disparity across the state in vaccination rates. We want to make sure this does not happen with coronavirus, and we want to start fixing this stuff in the future. Uh, we've already got big disparities in coronavirus death rates, unfortunately. Uh, the red line here is uh, Lincoln Lancaster County, blue is the Omaha metro area. Uh, the yellow line up here on the top, they, this is the Tri City, Grand Island, Hastings, Kearney, that, that big out JBS outbreak that pushed them up right on the spring. Off the spring. Uh, unfortunately, rest of rural Nebraska is, is catching up to them. I hope they don't pass that. Um, but we have some disparities in the health, and we can you know talk about that in the future. But unfortunately, the, the death rate for coronavirus is very disparate across the Nebraska. Um, you may have seen, I've been ha happy to see this Unhealthy Nebraska series. Uh, what they're doing is talking about, well, everything we're doing about coronavirus, can we turn that to do other things to make the state healthier? And this is Ali Khan in one of the, the first articles talking about how we could do things across the state, take the same strategies we're using for coronavirus, and then use them for other things and start doing other things to prevent the decline in health across Nebraska. 
Uh, this uh, speaks well to me. I grew up in a small town, western Nebraska. This is me at the Cheyenne County Fair with my 4-H heifer that year. And if you remember the 4-H pledge, it's using your head to clear thinking. That means good health data. Uh, heart because we care, hands because we're willing to do the work, and it's about health. And so actually the 4-H health uh, pledge, it's, uh, 4-H pledge kind of speaks to what uh, I think we need to do from a public health standpoint as well. Uh, Nebraska used to be one of the tops uh, when it came to health. Uh, we used to be number five in, in America's health rankings, but we've been steadily dropping for decades, unfortunately. Uh, and it's not just a, a random ranking. It shows up in our life expectancy. So there was a time, uh, this is both Kansas and Nebraska, used to be one of the leaders in life expectancy. Uh, we've been losing ground. We're kind of close to average, and others have passed us by. Uh, and so we want to change some of this stuff. Um, you know, and it's not just life expectancy. It's pretty much every measure. Uh, one of my uh, role models in life is Hans Rosling. He was a professor of population health at the Carroll Institute that was a perennial TED speaker and had for a while one of his stat slides was actually one of the highest uh, watched TED talks of all time for about a decade actually. Uh, very caring guy, interesting guy. He actually, uh, one of his side uh, projects, uh, side hobbies was sword swallowing. He actually does that in one of his presentations and talks to you about the tips of sword swallowing. But one of his things he used to say in his uh, presentations, if you can only follow one measure, you would follow infant mortality because infants are the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, so how are we doing for infant mortality? Well, unfortunately, we were losing ground on infant mortality. So we used to be better, but we're losing ground uh, in general. Uh, we could be doing better. And so uh, maybe we should focus next around maternal child health across Nebraska. Uh, a local example that we're doing here in Lincoln is we've been working with our health department and Tommy George, our epidemiologist, to, to track vital records data for a while now. Uh, one, our, one positive example is we've been working on breastfeeding projects at the community level for about eight years now. Uh, and we've had very big improvements. So 90% of women in Lincoln or more want to breastfeed uh, pretty much across even ethnicities and income. And so we've made a lot of, by making this a community approach with really good data to track. Uh, so like that 4-H, that uh, you need your head in, to, in the game, you need some good data. You can make a big difference over this. And so wouldn't it be nice to be doing this across the state. Wouldn't it be great if this data was available to every public health district? Uh, we can start working on breastfeeding. I'd love to work on low birth weight. We haven't made any progress there. Uh, teen pregnancy, we've actually uh, cut uh, some teen pregnancy and low-income women in half in Lincoln. So, you know, we've made progress on a lot of things, uh, but it takes tracking good data and having an organized or systematic approach to these things, a nice public health response. Uh, let's take all the things we need to be doing for coronavirus, and then this summer, let's get them turned toward other things to make Nebraska the healthiest state in the country again. Uh, and back to vaccines, so again, vaccine issues, uh, vaccines don't work until they become vaccinations, so we still have sort of a disorganized effort. Uh, one of my favorite person, I, people I follow lately is this year local epidemiologist. She's on Facebook, an epidemiologist from the University of Texas. She's been putting a lot of good summaries out, like everything coming out in the vaccine. She puts a really nice, succinct analysis. Uh, but I think this was a good visual for how our vaccine rollout. Uh, warp speed was great in getting the vaccine out, but our, our distribution has just been a, dis, you know, leaves a lot to be desired. This is a pretty good visual for kind of what it's been like uh, so far. Uh, we're still changing our prioritization. Uh, actually, I agree with focusing a little bit more on the elderly. That's the highest mortality rate. If you vaccinate over 65, you're going to get rid of the majority of, of your mort or fatalities. So I do think, uh, I do like this uh, focus on one, uh, uh, focusing more on people over 65 as a higher priority, and two, not holding back the dose. Uh, we've have, we should have a better logistics and know that those next vaccines are coming in. So let's not keep half of them in the fridge. Let's get them in arms as soon as possible. So I do like this uh, new change coming out. Uh, I still am a little frustrated at the state's mixed messaging. So uh, again, I answered my survey for Test Nebraska, and again, they have the wrong numbers up here. Nobody thinks 50 to 70 percent is herd immunity. Nobody uh, would would say that eventually that many people will get infected. We all think we're going to vaccinate people first, not that they'll eventually get infected. So this is wrong. And they actually don't even mention wearing a mask in this response when you answer your survey, which is really irritating. Um, you know, as Fauci says, it's 75, 80 uh, percent. Last time. Uh, we talked about the math for herd immunity uh, with a 95% vaccine efficacy. If we start having a more infectious strain come in, uh, we could be pushing 80, 85%. So probably at least 70%, but maybe as far as 85% to get to herd immunity. Um, one of the frustrating things I see is we still are not involving the physician networks. If we're going to prioritize people who are over 65, who have diabetes, who have heart disease, who is the best has best access to the people it's the primary care doctors the physician networks uh, do this on a regular basis we do this every year for influenza and we have a proven track record and also the studies show that the people the population trusts more than anybody else in vaccinations is primary care doctors so let's make them part of the effort 
Uh, we do this on a regular basis, so my day job, I'm at One Health Nebraska, and I previously I helped start the Southeast Rural Physicians Association. We regularly get 80% of our, our elderly patients vaccinated against influenza every year, despite similar logistics issues. Uh, the flu shots never come out on time. They always get to the doctor's office last, it seems like. But we, even despite the dumb convoluted mess, we still are easily getting 80 plus percent vaccinated most of the time. Uh, again, uh, pa patients do trust the, the, the messages directly from the healthcare providers. I think these, this set of messages coming out from the doctors and nurses at the hospitals was probably the biggest thing that got people to pay attention and start doing a better job of wearing masks. So we need more of those messaging coming direct from healthcare providers. Uh, also, you know, what there's still, uh, thankfully the polls are showing that people are becoming more receptive to vaccinating and the vaccine hesitant. Uh, there's some good studies that have come out showing who what tends to convince them and what kind of messages work. So here's the messages that work. Uh, one, getting vaccinated will help keep your family safe. We're all motivated, we all care about our family. And when you get vaccinated, you're not just protecting you. A lot of times you're protecting the entire community, including most importantly, your family. Uh, and so getting vaccinated will help your family. Uh, when people hear that the vaccine is 95% effective, which it is, that helps convince them. Uh, the other thing that I've heard a lot of physicians say that they've had patients come in that say they're hesitant to get it. Well, they'll, they'll just respond, well, do you wanna do six to 12 months of this? I'm tired of this, aren't you? Oh, well, yeah, if this gets us out of this, then I'll get the vaccine. And that is true. So vaccines are the fastest way to ending this pandemic and getting us back to normal. And then the side effects really are not nearly what the and sort of some headlines are, are maximizing that again. There were some few allergic reactions, but they're very low, a handful, most easily treated with an EpiPen, Benadryl, maybe short observation, but they're pretty rare. The vaccine's been given to more than 10 million people already uh, worldwide. There are side effects with a second shot, definitely, uh, although most of them are essentially are normal signs the body is building protection. They're, you're not really sick, it's the immune response developing, uh, and it's more so at that second shot. Most of those side effects last one or two days. It's usually pretty mild, tiredness, maybe some fatigue, maybe a headache, maybe a slight fever. Uh, so, you know, get the vaccine on a Friday if it's your second dose in case you need to sleep in a little on Saturday. Uh, but most it's pretty temporary and pretty mild and certainly much better than being sick for weeks at a time uh, like a lot of folks have been with coronavirus. Uh, the, the, again, misconceptions about uh, acquired herd immunity. I linked to this article that kind of, if you want a full explanation of why, quote, getting, going to herd the, the old way of getting the vac of getting the infection would work, it will not work, actually. You're still going to have prolonged infections where million more, millions more would get infected even after, quote, hitting herd immunity that way. Uh, so just hitting a herd immunity threshold does not stop the, the transmission completely, especially when you're starting from a very high number. Uh, and so that's why we need to focus not just on the vaccine, but also getting uh, infection rates down. Uh, this was the gist of the article published by Rochelle Lunsley and colleagues. She's our incoming CDC director, probably will hopefully be in office within weeks. Uh, so we need to do both. You, you, we need to not just focus on vaccine. We also need to get people wearing masks. Uh, that will get us there faster. So basic control measures, getting people, if you're in around anybody who's not in your household, wear a mask. Uh, that has been the most effective measure we have. Avoided those crowded and confined spaces, keep your distance, and get vaccinated when your number is up. That will keep our deaths down below 2,000. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, again, the disclaimer, these are my opinions and not necessarily of all these organizations I work with and for, but this is so you can verify who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, and hopefully this is helpful to you.